you can get somebody to like you, they're going to buy from you. And we started to realize from that sales job, it's we don't really care about the sales anymore. We just want people to like us. Let's, right, let's. right. So a cooking class was exactly that, where somebody's able to tell us why they're buying or why they're doing the cooking class or why they enjoy it. And that's huge for us. That's what we do. Hey, everyone. You're watching the Lively Charleston podcast. Our goal with the show is to interact with and tell the stories of the amazing people, places, and businesses that make Charleston the best city in the world. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. And check us out on Instagram and Facebook where we post content regularly throughout the week. Thanks so much, guys. Hope you enjoy the episode. Y'all are in for a treat with today's guests as we have not one, but two amazing and super hardworking Charleston small business owners on the show today. Our guests today wear white collars by day, aprons by night. One was born in South Korea, the other in Pittsburgh. Now here we are, 30-something years later, and somewhere along the way they met fell in love, got married, moved to Charleston, and started their Korean mandu company, Sarah's Dumps. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nate and Sarah Scalise to the podcast. Yo! Oh, guys, the crowd goes wild. That's the only button I push during the whole episode. It's my I favorite like one. it. I thought there were people outside the door. Use it more. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the fans are outside. Just... Hope you brought a Sharpie. How you guys doing? Doing good. We're How good. you doing? Let's. Uh, I'm doing really good. You know, let's kick things off here with the with the little toast. This is the first lively Charleston episode with beers and a and a black cherry white cloth. Yeah, black cherry only. Cheers, guys. Excited to have you on the show here. Not just any beer, delicious ice cold yingling. Is that your go to? Yeah, I was hoping to get sponsorship, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, this episode sponsored by Yingling. And anything you want to add to that? Hashtag Yingling. <laughs> is that how hashtags work? Why would someone drink Yingling? Why wouldn't you? Fair enough. Like saying, why would you eat food? Rest my case. Rest my case. All right, guys. So we have a lot to talk about here today. And you're also our first double guest episode here. Yes. Right. So a, a lot of firsts going on. Let's a lot do of firsts. It. Okay. So let's talk about, uh, we're going to talk business. We're going to talk marriage. We're going to talk the combination of those two and, and how that's going so far. <laughs> um, but let's take things, let's take things back a little bit here. And you're free to share as much as you like <laughs> or as little as you like. Um, so before we get into, you know, what you do for work and um, what you're doing around the community as far as, you know, business and what your goals are there, let's go back a little bit to people that uh, influenced you guys early on. Uh, Sarah, you mentioned that, um, you know, your dad had a big influence on you and how your brothers are the coolest people you've ever met. And um, Nate, you had a, you grew up in kind of a competitive household. So what's uh, tell us a little bit about that and just kind of how that's shaped who you are today and, and how you got where you are today. Yeah, growing up in upstate New York as a little Asian girl was unique. And I would say more common in the 80s, not so much now, because the small town that I grew up in was predominantly white, which is cool. But my family thought it would be only fair to me to have me go to some Korean culture camps in upstate New York. And so that started when I was a very, very young, like before I can even remember what was going on. And the only proof is the photos that we have in our family photo albums. But it was learning the basics of being Korean. And I thought that was just the coolest thing when I was little because everyone looked like me at this camp. And that was the only time in my life where I saw really anyone that looked like me. And all of the parents looked different. They looked like my parents. So that was really cool. And I credit my parents for doing that. And I think that was part of the process of adoption at that point, is to make sure that your kids never felt like because they looked different meant that that was wrong, you know? So is that something you were pretty... Um astutely aware of even as you were when you were a child that like you didn't really look like your parents even like before you guys had that conversation yeah I mean my parents adopted me from South Korea because my dad's best friend and his wife adopted their daughter from South Korea and she's a few years older than me so she used to babysit me you know growing up so I did have somebody where I saw a similar situation and it was more of like they did this and then we did this, so it makes sense. That's normal, you know? But, you know, we didn't eat 
Asian food. There wasn't even like a Chinese restaurant in my hometown. <laughs> we ate a lot of Italian food. So that's what I grew up on. That's heartbreaking because so, just like hometown Chinese food is, to, it, it, there's just something amazing about that. Like it's, it's heartbreaking that you didn't experience that as part of your childhood. Yeah. I just, I don't feel like it's that heartbreaking looking back <laughs> on it, you know, because there is one place that I know of now, now that I'm older and I'm like, you know what? I will never go back to my hometown and have any desire to try out that place at this point. Like I have lasted almost 33 years without eating this food and I'm probably totally you made fine it. without it. You made it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was like a test when I was younger, maybe. I tried no, to convince her to go once. Yeah. Did you say this specific restaurant? Yeah, it was like a little sushi uh, Chinese place. It was, no, a, it was a buffet, wasn't it? Yeah, in upstate New York, oh, it's just oh. very questionable. Yeah, it was right next to a landlocked. trailer that actually sold uh, liquor. Oh, wow. I think the trailer actually burned down. It burnt down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Questionable. Yeah. Questionable. Yeah. What, uh, okay, so is it a boycott against all Chinese food or just this specific oh, no. restaurant? I didn't even knowingly boycott it. It's just nothing that I really... Oh, well, let's be clear. We don't boycott Chinese food. Right. Okay. But when so I was younger... Sure. That was, yeah, yeah, that's what I needed to know. When I was younger, it was just all of the privately owned places in my hometown were all Italian food. So that's what you ate pizza and you ate pasta. I'm still like a huge carb lover okay. in my soul. So... It was weird, you know, you grow up Korean, but your family and you're surrounded by something totally different. And then you venture off to college or wherever life takes you next. And then maybe go to these bigger cities from that very, very small hometown and you start seeing the world grow, you know. So and also I credit my brothers because they're much older than me. And yes, when I was younger, I thought they were the coolest people. I don't know that I had that much knowledge of other humans in my life in general, to be fair. Her <laughs> brothers are cool. But they are still super cool. <laughs> I love it. All right. Nate, what about you, man? What um, You grew up in a, uh, a competitive household. Sports were kind of at the focus of, of a lot of your activities growing up. Yeah, I mean, I think it was... It was less of the household and more of the family around it, right? I mean, I grew up around all my cousins, uh, like to this day, like my cousins or like my brother and my sister. It's, uh, you name anything. I mean, it was floor hockey inside a little three foot wide little walkway that we used to play floor hockey on or just randomly try to toss a ball and tackle each other through it. I mean, yep. it was everything. Love We're it. in competition you know. with them this yeah. month right now. Look, Those I, cousins. I, I spent money on a, a whatever this is. I don't even know what it is, but <laughs> what, it, what it, is this device? it tracks me working out. It's it, the whole idea was to be competitive. So you're in a, you're in a little workout competition. Yeah. Needless to say, I'm probably losing. So the, as okay. we sip on the yingling, <laughs> well, the, there's proof here. I hope, I hope it wasn't like a nutrition challenge where you have to give up alcohol for, no, no we don't okay. do nutrition challenges. We, We've yeah. tried that once. It felt miserably. It's so, not about the calories in. It was about the calories burnt out. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. So, these uh, so cousins, everybody kind of grew up in a, in uh, you know kind of a, a competitive household, like you said. Is that something? Clearly, that's something that still rings true today. Oh, it's everything and anything. Sarah and I still bet on stuff all the time. That's I mean, I think that that's what makes our marriage work. Did you all bet on the the Bill Steelers game last year? Every time, every time you bet on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, what are, are we talking? Um, like, does the dishes? Are we talking cleans the house for a week or things we can't speak of on this PG thirteen <laughs> podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Okay. <laughs> well, at this point, there's a wager in place. That's all we need to know. We're betting <coughs> dumplings and ownership yeah, yeah, yeah. of the business. Ah. She's I'm, up win I'm winning. She's obviously, Go yeah. Bills. So there, there's equity stake on the line. Not we really. This is high stake. I was like, I would say this is pretty high stakes here. Okay. All right. So Sarah, when you were growing up, you wanted to be a vet, a doctor, a scientist, a teacher, and a meteorologist. Before you settled on entrepreneur and insurance salesperson mogul yeah is that is that accurate is that Pro fair producer would be the technical term producer. in the insurance okay. biz okay but top producer yeah i mean growing up my mom was a math teacher and my dad was a college professor and for whatever reason i was drawn to a lot of jobs that would require classes in math and science and then it turns out those are my weakest subjects and I was like, oh, okay, well, pivot, 
mid college <laughs> and we'll just do the business route. It's general enough and I'll just figure something out. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. That that sounds uh sounds pretty close to my heart as well <laughs> when you talk about my path going through college where I pretty much had no idea what the hell I was going to do. Um a funny story, I actually had um I was a computer science major and I had a um my teacher, he was an Asian guy and he kept, he had a, a, a thick, thick accent. And I just honestly couldn't understand what he was saying. Yeah. And I realized like probably like four weeks into it, this is freshman year. And I'm like, uh, I had a guy that was like, you got to go to computer science, man. That's where all the money is. I'm like, all right, I'll sign up for that. And like that was literally <laughs> my advice. decision process. I don't know. And I realized that I had like, I had a word wrong. Like, I think he was saying, um, I think he was saying variable. And every time he said variable, I had written down whereabouts in my notes for like four weeks. And I was like, okay, like, that's just a sign. I was like, I, I, this is hard enough. I already know what the hell I'm doing. Like, I have no idea. And I ended up getting out of it. Um, but yeah. And then switched like two, three more times. Cause I had literally no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and here you are in real estate. Yeah, here we are <laughs> on the podcast and it all winning worked path. out. It all worked You're out. Winning. Okay. Winning at life. And so Nate, you wanted to be a rich professional athlete. Yeah. I'm Still on track. That's- <laughs> Look, let's be very don't, clear. Don't I'm still up. an athlete, okay? I may be out of shape. Nah, I, I'm kind of an athlete. I'll, I'll take kind of. Okay, all right. But yeah, no, um, yeah, I mean, where I grew up, it was athletes were everything, right? I mean, the idea of being competitive, everything we did, whether it was, you know, what's the number one class you always look forward to back in grade PE school? always. That's it. Come on. I literally, I remember in fourth and fifth grade, I was, uh, I, I don't know what connections I had. The PE teacher would literally come up and pull me out of class. Be like, hey, we need another person for dodgeball. We need another person for flag football. They just pull me out of class. They just knew you were That's down. That's awesome. I don't know why. It was the weirdest thing. And I say this, right? I, I don't know why I didn't actually carry on playing more sports as I got older. Uh, it could have been lack of interest. I don't know. What but was your, yeah. If you could be a pro athlete in, in any sport, what was, your, what was your goal? Oh, it used to always be football. My mother would not let me play. Really? Yeah, she said uh, it was too hard of contact, even though she used to watch us play tackle football on the street. She's ahead of her time. Yeah. She yeah, knew. 100%. She, she knew before we knew. Yeah, yeah. so never ended up uh, playing. Used to play soccer a lot growing up. Played it pretty actively uh, during off-season, on-season, indoor, outdoor. Got into hockey for a little while. Um, certain situations basically couldn't play hockey. And then, yeah, decided, right. hey, I'm going to college. I'll get rich that way. We'll get rich that way. So it sounds like your Fingers rich cross this still happens. Your rich professional athlete dreams went pretty similarly to how mine went. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are on the podcast. Oh, we have ice cream. It all comes full circle to this podcast. Cheer, okay, cheers. Hey, all right. All right. So let's talk about what you guys do right now. So we wear we wear white collars by day. I like how you guys how you how you put that. You wear white collars by day, aprons by night. So um, Sarah, you're the first person in your family to become an entrepreneur. Yeah. That's pretty super badass. I didn't even realize it until I sent that to you. And I was like, huh. I was on the phone with Nate, and we were answering the the questions you sent. And I was like, is anyone else in my family an entrepreneur? I mean, not my immediate family. So that's pretty cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. So so I skipped ahead a little bit. Um, We'll get back to the entrepreneur stuff, the Sarah's dumps. So, but what do you do? Let's talk about the white collar piece. So my white collar, or lack thereof today, is as an insurance agent with a boutique independent insurance agency here in Mount Pleasant called Blueprint Insurance. And I just passed my four-year anniversary, which this is by far the longest I've been with a a single company. So that's cool. (laughs) And it's just been a very, very unique and cool way to connect with the community because at the end of the day when it comes to insurance everyone needs it everyone hates it probably to some extent either paying it or having to get it because of x y and z but everyone needs it and so why not have a really thorough and someone with integrity someone who is also involved in the community, help your small business, someone who owns a small business to help another small business. Yep. Yep. And yeah, it's just been really cool to network and get integrated into the community through insurance. 
Well, that's actually how we met was through a networking event. Yeah. And you are, um, I don't know if I've ever told you this to your face, but I say it behind your back all the time. Uh, but you're you're the best networker I've ever met. Just Thanks. in, in yeah. the, so you have the like first place trophy at my house for, for best networker. But you're just great at like meeting people, connecting. How can I help? Let's talk business. Let's be friends. And then just see where that relationship goes. Yeah. Um, so you're really great at that. And then on the insurance side, I know, I honestly don't know. You insure a couple of things that I own. I don't, I don't even <laughs> Every, remember what those are sometimes. All the own. things I own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I tell you what, it's pretty damn nice to just be able to like shoot a text. Yeah. And be like, hey, what's the deal with this again? Or instead of having to call, you know, 1-800 whatever and yeah. then press three and then press four and then wait six minutes and then get hung up on break something, start the whole process over again, yeah. you know, so it's definitely nice, you know, having you local to be able to just kind of reach out to any time. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Quick. I want to talk about Sarah's dump. So Nate, I hate to put you on the spot here, but quickly, um, what do you do? And quickly, what do you do? What do I do? Yes. White collar. What do I do? White collar. Babe, Tim, oh, white collar. What do I do? Oh, um, yes. business banker during the day. Business so, banker during the yeah, day. Yeah. Yeah. I work for Bank of America. Okay. I'm located over at the end of that branch over here in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Cool <laughs> Shameless no. plug. Google it. No, but honestly, yeah, uh, business banker. I used to work for Bank of America when we first came down here about six years ago. And okay. I started with the bank kind of as an interim job. I came out of a role up in Charlotte as a basically like a sales manager for an inside office. Kind of took a step back and decided I wanted to go back to the sales side. Got into it and realized very shortly after. One, I'm never going to be as phenomenal as Sarah at networking. And every time I went to a networking event, they said, oh. No one will be. Well, they're like, oh, you're Sarah's husband. I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, nice damn name. You're nice welcome. You. Yeah. So it kind of turned all these things. I was like, well, I love the business environment. And that's when I kind of started making a push with the bank to actually go to only business. So I went into the business, technically small business consultant role. We're basically on a daily basis. I'm meeting with clients, kind of go over finances. It could be something as basic as setting up an account. Awesome. From the ground up. Awesome. And you, um, if we set humility aside for a second, you are the youngest sales manager in your company's history. Is that correct? Oh, we put that in there. Uh, that was that was the previous company. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the no, previous company. American. Okay. And for the record, oh. you told me to put it in there, so don't act like, oh, we put that I've re in I there. I really didn't remember. I've definitely told quite a few people that. I okay. mean, it's a fact. I had a HR person look it up. Yeah, well, no, yeah, we need to know these things. That's we need to know these things. Let's that check is impressive. Let's, let's double check, see if there's ever had anybody younger. No, let's not do that. I like holding that. Let, let's just hold it. Yeah. Hey, Any, yeah. Anybody can uh, confirm, leave a comment if you can you know, Pro refute prove that. Me, prove me wrong. Otherwise, yeah, we're, we're not too worried about hey, it. Hey, we're so, good. Either way, pretty badass. Yeah. Hey. All right, guys. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about Sarah's dumps here. So you guys started this thing accidentally. That's, uh, I did not know that when I was, uh, yeah. when I was kind of reading through um, some of your info here. So you're making some food for a potluck for some friends and then... What happened? Shit just went viral from there or what? Well, it wasn't even for friends. Yeah, it was for my co-working space, which I'm still at. And we did some international food or world food day, yeah. I think it was technically. And I was like, I'm going to make mandu and I'm going to cook it there because that is the most dramatic attention grabbing thing that I could do. Whereas everyone else was just like picking something up and bringing it in a container. Like the Harris Teeter pota potato salad or something yeah, like that. Yeah, the German so potato salad. It's good, yeah. it's the it's German good. chocolate cake. Yeah. You know, fried rice from the Chinese place, which was all delicious. But I was like, I'm going to cook them there. So I cooked them. And I was like, oh, this is not our best effort because I've made them a lot for a lot of different people. But for the most part, until that point, it was all people that I was friends with. So they kind of had to tell me they were good, even if they weren't that good, because they didn't want to hurt my feelings. And this was the first time that coworkers and like pretty much strangers were like, wow, these are really good. And I'm like, oh, really? And then we went to social media because that's where all of the answers are. And we did some polls and we were like, if we made dumplings, would you pay money for them? This is like a very <laughs> general question. At this point, I'm intrigued. And people are like, yes, 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 please make them. Let us know when you launch it. How can I buy them? And we're like, people are eager. They want this stuff. And so Nate's like, we should try it. And I'm like, I don't know. It seems like a lot of work. And Nate's like, we should try it. And I'm like, all right, well, let's try it like casually for a few weeks. Just dip a toe in the water. You did a little market research. Yeah. Dip a toe in the water. Yeah. yeah. 
see who see what the market will bear in terms of price, right? And then we'll figure out what our margin is, and then we can scale if it works. It started off with five dumplings. Yeah, we were order. selling it. We're like, oh my god, will people pay five dollars for five dumplings? Actually, we started we, that's so five dollars for six, six dumplings. dumplings. And then people yeah. were getting confused. So we're like, yeah. all right, a dollar a dump, a dollar a dump. Just has a ring to it. At that point, we also didn't know how to freeze them at first. We did like the IQF standard where you do individual quick freeze. We're trying to put them in our home freezer, trying to make it work, bagging up in little sandwich bags, five dumplings at a time, trying yes. to figure out if we should do packaging. Should we not? Is it going to sell? We're not sure. It was very legit. We definitely used the dumpling emoji as our logo. Thank you, Apple. Yeah. Wait, your real logo is the dumpling emoji? No, it used to be. Oh, it was. The, first, it, the first iteration. Do we, we have a cease and company. desist? We didn't get a cease and desist. No, <laughs> you're too small. They don't Whoa. care. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Is it, hold it. They're selling these for six, for five bucks, and they're using our emoji? Yeah. But yeah. Call the attorneys <laughs> yeah. ASAP. They know what's coming. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they're watching, though. They're watching carefully. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, you guys... Uh, so you get a little little momentum, friends and family, and then two months later, you're in a DHEC kitchen, and uh, this thing's really got some legs to it. Yeah. Yeah, the insurance agent in me was like, we got to do things legit. We're also both, maybe this is an ode to our white-collar jobs, but we're also both very much rule followers, and we're like, if we're going to do it, it's going to be legit. We don't want people to be fearful of buying our product because it's made in a home kitchen but there's meat in it and other products. So we're like, we got to make it legit from the get-go if we're going to do it. Yeah, I think it's really started off whenever we got to the point that it was people that we didn't know, not even friends of friends, somebody that just randomly heard friend of a friend of a friend that reached out to us. We're like, oh, we don't know this person. Like, they're coming to our house. It's super awkward. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, so fair enough. Kind of branched out from there. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Well, I mean, I think that's the, um, that's the fun in any small business when you first get started. Yeah. You know, like whether it's you're out of the park doing personal training, you know, uh, hoping to, to wrap up the class before uh, you you get cuffed for trespassing or something. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, you're cooking dumps out of your home kitchen, like whatever it is, those those early days, those are kind of the fun ones there when you're figuring everything out. Won't forget them. So you guys, um, another fun fact is you started this, uh, what, basically immediately before COVID-19 pandemic shocked the world. Yeah, well, you know, COVID wasn't going to come here. <laughs> so we were like, oh, well, it's safe. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, what, October, November? Officially, November is when we got our LLC and insurance and all that set up. And then December was our first pop-up. And then we started doing dumpling making classes in January and February. And we're like, oh, man, this train is going. Okay, that, that's a super cool idea, the classes. What's the, um, can, can anybody just do that? Do people do that for date night or is that like a corporate like bonding, you know, type thing or like all what are those above. all about? Yeah, it could be all of the above. We haven't resumed them yet, but they were so fun. I mean, they would fill up really quickly. And then if people wanted us to come to their homes and just get a group of like 10 friends, then we would come there, bring everything with us and just make them in the dining room in the kitchen. And so they could just hang out for half the time when we were cooking them. Yeah. That's super. And I time. mean, would you guys, is this like, are we talking to bocce style where you're juggling and telling jokes? Like, is, is it the whole experience or what? No, we tend to be very serious people. So in this scenario, <laughs> yeah, clearly uh, no onion choo-choo train. So no, no onion choo-choo train. Um, it's in their premises. So we try not to burn anything. Okay. Down. So not a whole lot of yeah, fire yeah. and uh, things of that nature. Yeah. yeah. Still a very cool idea. So you're offering an experience as well as your product. Yeah. Yeah, and that was actually one of our favorite things. I mean, we love pop-ups, but we could actually interact with a smaller group of people and have more conversation than we could in a quick interaction where someone's coming and buying pop-ups and me asking a couple of questions and leaving and eating them. So we loved the class. I think we missed those the most. Yeah, I mean, I think both of us come from like a sales background. It's actually how we initially met in sales. And the number one thing we used to always talk about to any of our reps that we used to manage was, you know, it's about somebody liking you. If you can get somebody to like you, they're going to buy from you. And we started to realize from that sales job, it's, we don't really care about the sales anymore. We just want people to like us. Let's, right, let's right. get like the enjoyment going in the actual cooking class. Exactly what it was. They start to hear the story. We have some fun with them. I mean, you and I both know, uh, I tend to feed off other people's personalities. Oh, where we have some fun yes. and we just start going to town. Yes. So a cooking class was exactly that. That's you get awesome. to, you know, read people, understand them, kind of hear their story too. Mm -hmm. And it's more about 
I guess for us, we love the idea of this because other people get to enjoy it, right? So if we're in a situation with a class where somebody's able to tell us why they're buying or why they're doing the coding class or why they enjoy it, I mean, that's huge for us. That's the reason we do it. That's awesome. And that's like you get to have, you get to build a relationship with yeah. your with your customers. Um, you know, like you said, by the end of it, you, you've got some raving fans that uh, will tell everybody about it and probably continue to buy your, your dumplings as well. Yeah. Hopefully. So from, a, from a business model, I, I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so what's your guys, we got about... Uh, about three minutes or so, maybe four minutes here. So what's y'all's company vision? Where, where do you want to take Sarah's Dumps here in the next five, ten years? Well, we would oh, like wide, to wide, wide. yeah, go back to where we were pre-COVID, right? So we're getting back into the pop-up world starting next month in May, and that'll be amazing. And then hopefully we'll be able to resume classes before the end of the year. And besides that, I mean... I would love personally to have something called a dump shop where you come in and I'm inspired by Carrie Mori and Kelly's hot little biscuit setup where you go in and it's just kind of grab and go, right? You can order, yep, yep. everything's made, but you can't hang out. So no offense to people. We just think it would be easier because we don't want a full scale restaurant. We don't want to have a full menu, but we would love if people could come and then we could just be in one single place for frozen and cooked and use technology to our advantage in setting up that type of business model. Yeah. I think the idea is also about supporting the community, right? I mean, if we were to do that, we look at any small little boutiques that we go into, they have all local products. Mm -hmm. It's yep. huge. We want to offer the same thing. If we were to ever open a location, that's exactly what we do. In the front area, you're able to actually shop basically for anybody that's local. Yeah, a little Asian bodega. I, don't I know love it. That would be in Korean. What's, get back to you. what's a bodega? I'm going to have to Google that when we're done, unless you just tell me just what like that means. your little corner store that has okay. a bunch of stuff that you need, miscellaneous stuff, and a lot of bigger cities have one in Wait, every neighborhood. You've really never heard the word bodega? I think maybe I have. I've just never uh, been brave enough to ask what it means. No, that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess I don't know the shop. actual definition. I just assume it's corner store. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're all on the same page. All right. Everyone's right. Yeah. On that note, where guys, where can our viewers find you? If they want to learn more about Sarah's Dumps, where should they go? I would say Instagram is definitely the platform that we really got started on and the one that's updated the most frequently and the one that we interact with people on the most. And I think that's just because we have a product, you know, versus the services that we do by day. And it's easy to post pictures of super delicious and cute dumplings and then share them with everyone else. Back. Love it. Or you always have the option. Go to www.sarahsdumps.com. That's S-A-R-A-H-S-D-U-M-P-S. Oh. Yeah, you can Google Sarah's Dumps, too. It's we, safe. We should be the only people that show up. Just yeah, go. it's safe. <laughs> let's, let's be clear. It's, all, it's <laughs> like all of our stuff. It's cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, so Google Sarah's Dumps or find you on Instagram. <laughs> it won't get awkward. We promise. Let's, yeah. <laughs> No promises. Uh, <laughs> disclaimer, I cannot guarantee anything that they Nate just said is factual. Okay. We got less than a minute here, guys. Let's go 20 seconds each as quickly as you can answer. Lightning round. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who wants to take the plunge, start their own business, go out on their own, what would you say to them? I would say do it, but don't feel obligated to completely jump from what you're doing as your full-time job into this new venture. It's okay to do it kind of wading into the water little by little. Love it. And you're proving that model as we speak. Yes. Beautiful. Nate. If you're doing it with your wife, do as she tells you. Wow. <laughs> that was the this best answer I had. This is still recording, right? That's the best answer I had. Let's be very <laughs> honest here. That was perfect. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think it really is shut up and drive, right? I mean, the idea is you don't know what's going to come along. Just go with it. Just Figure go it with it. I love it. Guys, first episode with beers. Thank you so much. Sarah's Dumps. It's been a pleasure having you guys on the show. Cheers, guys. Appreciate Cheers. it. Hey, y'all. That's a wrap on today's episode. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like or follow or subscribe. Whatever platform you're on, just hit the button to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Yep, and please help us grow the channel by sharing it with someone else who might enjoy it as well. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.